in this module uh, we uh, shall discuss uh, thermal turbo machines and this is the uh, last module in this uh, series of lectures uh, as uh, we already mentioned uh, thermal turbo machines or uh, those machines that handle uh, compressible fluid as uh, as the working substance uh, centrifugal compressors, uh, fans and blowers all handle air. Uh, centrifugal turbines, as we saw in the case of an automotive turbocharger, uh, typically or usually handles a mixture of combustion gases. Axial compressors, again, uh, typically handle air. Axial turbines of the sort that is used in gas turbines or aircraft engines uh, all handle uh, typically a mixture of uh, combustion gases. Steam turbines, which are also axial, although that is not stated here explicitly, uh, handle uh, steam as the name uh, implies. Yeah. Uh, in this lecture, we will not, uh, uh, or at least in this module, we will not discuss uh, the, the two centrifugal machines that are indicated in red color here um for uh, two reasons number one this is um, uh, intended to be uh, an introductory course on uh, turbo machines number one number two uh, we have already discussed centrifugal machines at length uh, in the module on hydro turbo machines uh, so for because of these two reasons we will not discuss the centrifugal compressors or centrifugal uh, turbines in this module we will uh, focus our discussion on axial compressors axial turbines and steam turbines uh, gas turbines um, uh, use both axial compressors and axial turbines and you should uh, uh, be familiar uh, with the gas turbines from your um, um, applied thermodynamics course and the gas turbines uh, typically operate uh, in a Brayton cycle. This is the basic Brayton cycle. Many variations of this uh, Brayton cycle are possible as uh, you uh, uh, would be familiar. So basically the air under ambient condition enters the compressor. It's a steady flow device. Air enters um, under ambient conditions into the compressor where it is compressed uh, to uh, a high pressure. Um, hydrocarbon fuel is then mixed with the air and burnt and this increases the temperature of the uh, gases and the high temperature gases then enter uh, a turbine where they are expanded. Now the turbine produces sufficient power to run the compressor and the leftover power is actually used to run an electric generator in the case of a land-based uh, gas turbine uh, power generation unit. Now, in the case of an aircraft engine, uh, the leftover uh, power is actually, uh, not leftover power, the leftover enthalpy of the gases is actually converted into kinetic energy in a propulsion nozzle for uh, propulsion application. Uh, what we uh, um, uh, are going to do next is to actually take a look at the, uh, uh, the compressor that is used in a gas turbine, which is an axial compressor, and the turbine that is used uh, in the gas turbine, which is also an axial turbine. Notice that modern, most uh, modern gas turbine engines operate at pressures as high as 40 bar and uh, temperatures as high as uh, 1700 Kelvin. So these are the kinds of figures that we would be working with. And um, um, uh, most modern uh, land-based uh, uh, gas turbine power units, like the one that is shown in this picture, uh, run at a uh, speed of 3000 RPM in case the uh, supply frequency is uh, 50 Hertz or at a speed of 3600 RPM in case the supply frequency is 60 Hertz. Okay. So here uh, we see the rotor of uh, a land-based gas turbine uh, power generation unit. Notice that the casing has been removed, so only the rotor blades are shown here. So we see a multi-stage axial compressor here, many rotor blades followed by a combustor, and this is followed by an axial turbine. The axial turbine, as may be noticed, has far fewer stages than the compressor. Now, if I take uh, uh, an R equal to constant section of any rotor here and lay out the blade elements horizontally, this is what we would get. We have already seen this picture also uh, before. Uh, so if uh, we lay out the blade elements like this, uh, this is uh, what we see and uh, this is what we get if we lay out the blade elements of, a, of an axial turbine. Okay? Uh, 
um, uh, we can see that um, this is uh, in case it's a reaction machine we can see that uh, the uh, uh, enthalpy changes uh, across the rotor because by definition it's a reaction machine uh, so consequently since h plus c square over 2 is a constant the relative velocity also changes in the rotor now in the case of a compressor the enthalpy increases as a result of the input power uh, so the relative velocity decreases in the rotor blade passage and in the case of a turbine because work is produced the enthalpy of the fluid decreases and uh, consequently the relative velocity increases okay um, now it can be seen that the change in relative velocity is not very high in the case of an axial compressor and this is because the uh, deceleration of the fluid results in an increase in its pressure because basically it's a diffusion process and since the flow faces an adverse pressure gradient there is a danger that if the pressure gradient is too high the boundary layer uh, which forms on the surface of the blades can actually separate as a result of the adverse pressure gradient this uh, usually uh, results in compressor stalling and the erratic performance of the compressor and must be avoided at all costs so because of this danger we cannot uh, increase the pressure ratio to uh, very high values now in the case of a turbine in contrast the pressure gradient is uh, favorable uh, in the direction of flow because the pressure decreases and we can actually have as high a pressure drop as we would like in the case of a turbine blade passage okay? uh, now since the uh, uh, pressure drop can be uh, as high as possible consequently the work transfer in uh, in a turbine blade passage is also our turbine rotor is also very high and that is the reason why the turbine blades are uh, thicker when compared to the compressor blades okay? and the flow turning is also much higher in the case of the turbine blade uh, when compared to the compressor blade because the pressure ratio is limited by uh, the danger of uh, boundary layer separation the pressure rise uh, and consequently the work transfer and flow turning are uh, uh, minimal in the case of a compressor uh, rotor uh, whereas they can be quite high in the case of a uh, turbine rotor okay, so let us um, summarize these, obs uh, these uh, observations here uh, the cross sectional area of the blade passage in decreases in the case of a turbine and increases in the case of a compressor um, because of this, the magnitude of the relative velocity increases in the case of a turbine and decreases in the case of a compressor, which suggests that the flow undergoes an expansion due to flow acceleration in the case of the turbine, and it undergoes a compression due to the flow deceleration or diffusion in the case of a compressor. Okay? So the blade passage of a turbine resembles a nozzle, and that of a compressor resembles a diffuser. And as we already mentioned, the flow turning and hence the work transfer is high in the case of a turbine on account of the favorable pressure gradient. And consequently, the blades are thicker and the flow turning is also, and as we said, are, is quite high. In the case of the compressor, the flow turning and work transfer is limited or quite small owing to the danger of flow separation. And the blades are consequently slender. Okay? So here uh, we show what happens when the flow separates. The boundary layer separates from the blade surface. So it can separate either on the uh, upper surface or on the lower surface of the blade. And when this happens, the flow becomes unsteady. And the compressor performance also becomes highly unstable. And these unsteady mechanical stresses can be catastrophic on the compressor blade. So, and uh, this must be avoided at all costs during uh, operation of the axial flow compressor. Now, an axial flow impulse uh, turbine uh, looks like this. The rotor of an axial flow impulse turbine looks like this. Um, all the enthalpy drop in this case occurs in the nozzle, which is located upstream of the uh, rotor. And the fluid, which comes out at high velocity, impinges on the blades and the, uh, it simply uh, changes direction uh, in the rotor blade passage as shown here what is that the magnitude of the relative velocity remains constant because it's an impulse machine there is no change in enthalpy and hence there is no change in uh, relative velocity in the blade passage there is only a change in direction okay? and because the uh, absolute velocity at inlet to the rotor is very high in the case of uh, an axial turbine the uh, blade rpm usually tends to be quite high in the case of an impulse turbine. 
For a given amount of work transfer, the change in absolute velocity is higher for an impulse machine when compared to a reaction machine, which is quite obvious from what we have said so far. So this usually results in higher blade speeds for the impulse machine. Now, reaction machines achieve work transfer through a combination of change in relative and absolute velocity, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, so they tend to be much more compact and can run at lower blade speeds, which is desirable because the centrifugal stress on the blades is lessened to that extent. Okay. Now, uh, one important aspect that we must uh, keep in mind is that because of um, uh, the limitations that exist in the kind of pressure rise that we can have in a compressor blade passage, if we want to operate at pressure ratios around 40 to 1, then we cannot achieve that uh, using a single rotor. That fact is obvious. So we need to use multiple rotors to accomplish this. Uh, although uh, the work transfer and the pressure drop can be higher in the case of a uh, reaction turbine or even an impulse turbine, it is still probably desirable to actually have uh, uh, the work transfer, the complete work transfer take place across a few stages of uh, a turbine instead of just one stage. So uh, the way forward in the practical design or realization of these machines is to have uh, uh, quite a large number of stages for a compressor because the pressure rise is limited and here because the pressure rise is not limited we can have a fewer number of stages in the case of the turbine and this is obvious from uh, the gas turbine uh, picture that is shown here notice that the number of uh, rotors in the, on the compressor side uh, is about uh, 12 to 15 whereas we have only four uh, uh, rotors on the turbine side Okay. Um, it's uh, further important to note that probably only one or two of the turbine stages drive the uh, entire 12 to 15 compressor stages and the remaining turbine stages uh, convert the enthalpy of the combustion gases to work which is used to run the uh, generator. So the basic idea is uh, we are going to need far more stages in the case of the compressor because of the limit on the pressure rise that we can achieve in each uh, rotor. Whereas the number of stages on the turbine side can be, uh, number of rotors on the turbine side can be uh, lesser. So that is what is actually uh, done. Okay. So in in a real life application, by uh, having uh, multiple uh, rotor blades, we can reduce the work transfer in each rotor blade, and consequently, the uh, rotational speed of the rotor blade can also be brought down. Okay, so this actually reduces the mechanical stresses on the rotor, and that is what is done in practical insulation. Now, when we uh, say that uh, we need to have uh, multiple rotors, as we saw here, uh, multiple rotors uh, on the compressor side or turbine side, uh, notice that yeah, we simply cannot uh, uh, place one rotor after next. Um, in these axial machines because the flow angles at the uh, uh, the flow angles at the entry and exit of a rotor uh, are not the same. Uh, so which means that um, uh, we need to have uh, guide vanes or stationary vanes in between the uh, rotor blades in order to direct the flow smoothly from one set of rotor blade to the next. Now, each stator rotor pair is called a stage, and this is the design strategy of having multiple rotor blades with um, uh, stator blades in between each one of them is called multi stage. Okay. The moving blades are obviously attached to the rotor and the hub, uh, which in turn is connected to the shaft, as we can see here. Notice that the moving blades are attached to the hub, which is connected to the shaft. And stationary blades go in between these uh, rotor blades. Uh, as I said before, only the rotor blades are shown in this figure. Uh, uh, the guide vanes or stationary blades go in between these rotor blades. And they are fixed to the casing. And they are fixed to the, uh, fixed to the casing. Uh, 
Now, it is also possible to actually fix the stator blades to the casing in such a manner that they are movable, in which case they are called variable guide vanes. And this is something that we will discuss later. Okay. What is that? The uh, inlet exit stator blade angle is the same as the exit inlet rotor fluid angle. Okay, let us see how this comes about. So here we have uh, illustrations of a multi-stage uh, compressor and a multi-stage turbine. So we can see that, you know, this is a rotor. So fluid enters the rotor and this rotor, and this is the next set of rotor. So before the fluid enters the next set of rotor, these guide vanes uh, redirect the fluid in a proper manner so that the flow uh, enters this uh, rotor in such a way that the relative velocity is tangential to the uh, blade profile at the inlet. Okay, what is that? The flow angle at the inlet of the stator is the same as, is the same as the flow angle at the exit of the rotor, and the flow angle at the exit of the stator is the same as the flow angle at the inlet of the rotor. That is what we have said here. Okay. The inlet exit stator blade angle is the same as the exit inlet rotor fluid angle or flow angle. So here also we see uh, the same thing, but again, we notice that these uh, blades are slender and the flow turning is not very high. Whereas here the blades are much thicker and the flow turning is also very high. And consequently the stator veins also are uh, uh, thicker and highly curved when compared to the stator veins here, okay? Now, um, we can actually uh, try to do more with the stator blades than just redirect the flow, okay? Uh, as we said, the primary purpose of the stator blade is to achieve a change in direction of the fluid velocity. If it is going to do just this, then the blade passage area is constant. However, we can also um, uh, have a change in static enthalpy or pressure uh, in the uh, stator uh, blade passage, in which case we are actually making the stator do more work than just redirecting the fluid. So we can actually, in the case of a compressor, we can have a diverging passage uh, uh, in the, uh, between the stator blades, which will cause a certain amount of pressure increase here, and uh, so the pressure increase in the rotor stage can be that much lesser. Or in the case of a turbine, we can actually cause uh, the stator blade passage to be uh, like, uh, like a nozzle causing a, a pressure drop, which will then help in the rotor uh, realizing uh, more expansion. Okay? So we can actually make the stator veins do much more than just simply redirecting the flow. So we can have a pressure drop I'm sorry, pressure increase in the case of a compressor stator blade passage or a pressure drop in the case of a, uh, in the case of turbine blade passage as uh, shown here. Um, so in both cases, um, uh, there can be change in the static enthalpy uh, of the fluid in the stator blade passage, but not a change in stagnation enthalpy because there is no work interaction in this case. But the, um, uh, the static, uh, the stator blade passages in this case, do more than just redirect the flow. That is a very a desirable aspect. So uh, what happens as a result is that, you know, uh, in the case of an axial compressor, we can achieve um, pressure ratios as high as 40 through this multi-staging. And by designing the status, uh, not only to redirect the flow, but also to accomplish uh, the desired pressure increase or decrease, the um, number of stages required may be reduced a little bit and the, uh, the entire compressor assembly, stator plus rotor, is much more compact. So multi-staging is uh, very easy to do in the case of axial compressors and high uh, pressures can be realized while keeping the RPM at reasonably uh, uh, lower values. Okay? So all these features have made uh, axial compressors very attractive and consequently they are extensively used in practical applications. Despite the fundamental problem that uh, uh, in a fluid dynamic perspective, from a fluid dynamic perspective, uh, increase of pressure through uh, diffusion of the flow is not at all desirable, okay? So despite the fact that it's a fundamentally not a desirable way of accomplishing a pressure rise, the axial flow compressors are still extensively used because there are so many other advantages 
uh, in a practical realization. Okay? So typical pressure ratio across uh, stage of an axial compressor is about 1.15 uh, maybe 1.2 today in the most modern gas turbine engines. So if we want a pressure ratio of 40 across the um, entire compressor, then we need to have 27 stages, okay? Because the increase in pressure goes in a geometric progression. And typically uh, the um, uh, axial compressors are designed so that the axial velocity remains uh, uh, a constant as much as possible from the first to the last stage. So consequently, the height of the blade decreases as the density increases from the first to the la uh, last stage.